Welcome to Reading the Gospels Together for Wednesday, May the 6th, and today we're reading Mark chapter 12. Now, when we read the Bible in separate bits, we can miss how the Gospel writers are, are trying to tie things together and painting a picture of Jesus brush stroke by brush stroke in ways that we can understand. And chapter 12, which seems on the surface to be a collection of separate anecdotes, is actually tied together with what went on from the blind Mark Bartimaeus story on through the triumphal entry and the cleansing of the temple and the rest. Now let's see how that's actually tied together. First of all, remember that blind Bart introduced this whole theme by calling out to Jesus as son of David. And he does that twice in case we missed it the first time. Then when Jesus entered Jerusalem, we saw people spreading their, their cloaks and waving palm branches and crying out, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our father David, Hosanna in the highest heaven. We discovered that people, the people were actually singing Psalm 118, the psalm of the presence of God entering the temple in the celebration of the coming king. And then what happens? Jesus goes through the temple, throwing out the merchants and the money changers, saying the temple was no longer serving the function for which it was intended, which is to spiritually feed the people. And so as we were reminded of that unfortunate fig tree. Now keep those scenes in mind. So now we have Jesus in Jerusalem, likely on the temple steps where John places him in the gospel. And as he so often does, Jesus addresses the crowd by beginning with a parable. It's a hard one, a hard parable. The owner of a vineyard who places it in the trust of others, but those others repeatedly mistreat and ultimately kill those who represent the owner. Well, guess what the owner will do? Well, I'll quote Mark directly as Jesus speaks. What then will the owner of the vineyard do? He will come and kill those tenants and give the vineyard to others. Haven't you read this passage of scripture? The stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. The Lord has done this and it is marvelous in our eyes. Haven't you read the passage of scripture, says Jesus. Now this is, should put our antennas on and, and make us uh, pull our Bibles out. And where do we find that passage that Jesus is quoting? Well, guess what? Psalm 118, the very psalm that the crowd was singing as they waved palm branches in the air. You'll reject me, says Jesus. And when the cornerstone is taken away, this whole temple will fall down. Psalm 118 is the theme song for this whole section of Mark, and everything in this chapter occurs in the light of it, such as paying tax to Caesar. Now that's a familiar story. Do we pay taxes to Caesar or not? This time of year, most of us would, would rather not, but it's a trap. If Jesus says yes, he's in league with the Romans. If he says no, the Romans will string him up. Then Jesus asks this. He says, whose image is this and whose inscription? Now, if you know your Roman history, or if you haunt the antique coin shops in old Jerusalem like I enjoy doing, you'll see that the coins of the day had a picture of Tiberius, the Roman emperor, on them. Jews were forbidden to make images. Such a coin was considered idolatry, which is why you had money changers in the temple exchanging those forbidden image coins for temple shekels. They weren't simply breaking a 20. They were exchanging pagan Roman money with graven images on it for temple shekel money, which didn't have such things. But then Jesus asked another question. He said, whose inscription is on it? Now, pull a coin out of your pocket and you'll see the queen on one side and an inscription telling you who she is. A Tiberius era coin had this same, uh, had this written. It said, Augustus Tiberius, son of the divine Augustus. I guess, Augustus Tiberius, son of the divine Augustus. On the other side, it says, high priest, Pontifex Maximus. Now, the emperors were routinely high priests of the, of the main Roman cult. Son of God, high priest is what it said on that coin. Give back to Caesar what is Caesar. Give to God what is God, says Jesus. Mark has shortened the phrase in his Greek language to give back to Caesar what is Caesar and to God what is God's. But the more complete sentence is give back to Caesar what is Caesar and give back to God what is God's. Like the priesthood and the temple and true worship and allegiance 
And who is the son of God? Not like the Roman coin says, Caesar. No, like the Psalm said, Jesus. And who is the true high priest? Not Tiberius, not Caiaphas. Again, the answer, Jesus. Now, the crowd seems to know this. They're singing the song. But why don't the temple officials know this? How do they fail to recognize Jesus as the son of David, the Messiah, when it seems obvious to, to others? Well, the next story, odd though it is, answers this question. The Sadducees, who were largely in control of the temple, it's one of the religious, big religious parties, the Pharisees and the Sadducees and so on, the Hasmoneans. The Sadducees were largely in control of the temple, and they now tried to make fun of Jesus, who they well know was speaking in the past and currently about being raised from the dead. Sadducees did not believe in the resurrection, um, because they only adhered to the first five books of the Bible, uh, the Pentateuch as it's called, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. Now the resurrection is not known in those books. We've talked about this in Matthew, but here, pay attention to Jesus' response to them, of which I will quote but a part. He says, are you not in error because you do not know the scriptures or the power of God? He is not the God of the dead, but of the living. You're badly mistaken. So, in the context of everything that's just been going on, you don't recognize who I am or understand what I'm saying because you do not know the scriptures or the power of God. Wow, what an accusation. The only power you recognize, Jesus says in essence, is your own power, and in that you are badly mistaken. Now, happily, some teachers of the law do get the point. Mark tells us that this one fellow does get it. Mark says, this guy, he saw that Jesus gave a good answer. Jesus gives another good answer when the man asks him which commandment is the most important. And Jesus gives the answer any good Jew would know. The Shema Yisrael, the daily Jewish prayer and confession of faith. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. Now, that's the right answer, of course. Every Jew prayed that every day. But then Jesus does something unexpected. We're so used to hearing it, we miss it. The man asked Jesus for the greatest commandment, and Jesus answered. But then Jesus added something else. He said, the second is this, love your neighbor as yourself. There's no commandment greater than these. Jesus ties those two commandments, loving God and loving your neighbor as yourself. And that's revolutionary. Not because Jesus invented the love your neighbor as yourself part. That's found in the Old Testament as well. Leviticus, one of those first five books, uh, which is why the answer was considered good by that temple official. It's found in Leviticus chapter 19, verse 18. But that verse, love your neighbor as yourself, is hardly front and center. It's in a chapter entitled Various Laws. Uh, and it's mixed together with various sacrifices to be offered at various times. Just like what's happening in the temple. It's a chapter about the temple sacrificial laws. It includes other things like not holding back the wages of an employee, planting a field with only one kind of seed at a time. And Jesus reaches into this, this basket of disparate assorted laws, uh, which are the background to the whole temple mechanism, and he says, here's the important one, love your neighbor as yourself. This is the one that fits together with the first one. More so, there is no commandment greater than these. In other words, these two commandments, love God and love your neighbor, are more important than this temple. Now, how can Jesus say that? How can he overturn the whole temple system? Because, like the crowd proclaimed as they sang the song, he's the son of David, he's the true king, he's the true high priest, he is the son of God. There's lots there. Now, tomorrow we really shift gears and we're transported back not only to the days of Jesus in 30 AD, but the days of Mark and Peter in 60 AD and into the hearts and the minds of the Christians who had a very good cause to be very, very afraid. And yet at the same time, very, very hopeful. We'll see you tomorrow for Mark chapter 13.